Uh, let's begin with the earliest tours featured in the book. Their categorization as test tours has often always really struck me as a bit misleading and unfair. It sort of invites the comparison of South African cricket in 1888 with Australia in 1877, whereas in truth, South Africa in 1888 compares more in cricketing terms with Australia in 1861. Australia had had no fewer than three visits from England and a decade and a half to improve the game domestically before it played a test match, whereas South Africa, well, we dove in head first and were playing the mother country straight away, giving the impression that Australian cricket accelerated or developed at a far greater rate than South African cricket did. Uh, th I think the the point about the tests is that they were they they were deci decided to be tests retrospectively, and they were decided retrospectively for political reasons, uh, which uh, to do with the formation of the ICC and with South Africa's place in the relationship of the triumvirate between England and Australia, uh, and and the politics of that and they weren't really anything to do with the nature of the the contests that took place all one can say about them was, it, was that they were in fact certainly before 1900 the only 11 aside games that were played on the tours so they were they were seen as the the key the key games that were uh, that, that actually took place the rest of them were games against odds i mean test really is just a word invented subsequently to describe 11 aside matches between two countries yes i think that's right and i think it's of course it's debatable whether uh, whether they were indeed both countries at all in fact whether whether the uh, uh, whether from england's point of view the team was representative of england uh, given they were picked by a private members club uh, and by particular individuals with very like Lord Hawke uh, with very strong vested interests in, in who should be in the team and why these things should happen at all. Uh, and on the South African side, uh, because from a South African point of view, you were, you were despite the, uh, the exceptional amount of cricketing activity played across all communities in South Africa, South Africa decided, and Cecil Rose decided, uh, partly because of his uh, because of his 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 need to ensure that the mining industry uh, had sufficient cheap labour uh, to to create essentially a job colour bar, or indeed a, 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 a what what was known as segregation at the time, uh, and therefore that black players were from whatever community they came, whether they came from the Indian community. Uh, indentured laborers who had been in South Africa from the 1860s onwards, uh, living primarily in Natal, or from the so-called Cape Colored community, where be, they'd been uh, they'd been descendants of of, uh, of of slave labor from Indonesia and other parts of of Asia and Africa, um, or indeed from from the African community themselves, where they'd been uh, indigenous quasi who'd been uh, uh, who'd been in the southern african continent for the last thousand years whether they were descended none of those communities were uh, were represented in any way despite having a very vibrant cricket culture all three of them uh, and that meant that from the start south africa was actually already had put itself very much onto the black back foot as far as cricket was concerned because it was simply a, looking at cricket as a as a white preserve and that's why cricket and empire and politics are all much the same thing because ultimately ultimately south africa's decision uh it's supported strongly of course by by the ncc and by lords uh to to simply play whites as as south africans uh a, a state of affairs which continued all the way up to to the dolavira issue and beyond um that meant of course that, that ultimately we were talking about it, the nature of of relations between two uh between an imperial power and and essentially a colony and that the colony was uh, was pretty determined to ensure that as a settler colony, uh, the only legitimate representatives of that colony were going to be white. You talk about statisticians. One reason to feel slightly resentful about the status of these early matches is that to remove them would be to remove the likes of George Lohman, J.J. Ferris, and even Sidney Barnes from the ranks of Test cricket's greatest strike bowlers. Do that, and you're left with five South Africans, uh, Dwan Olivier, K.G. Rabada, Dale Stain, Pochler, and Ngidi, in the all-time six strike bowlers in history. Lohman, Ferris, and Barnes have rather been dining out on batsmen barely worthy 
worthy of first class status. Uh, another reason for being dubious about the status of these matches is that, although I suppose you could apply this to virtually all pre-World War II test cricket, neither team or squad was representative either of its country's social base or its cricketing strength. Would you say a bit about that in the case both of South Africa and England or the MCC? Yes, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I think, as I suggested from a South African point of view, uh, there was absolutely uh, there was a minimal amount of representation in any real sense, um, partly for 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 racist reasons, uh, but partly, of course, also because South Africa was a uh, was was an extremely complex, large and complex region, uh, and and white settlement was was scattered very very thinly across the. The subcontinent, uh, and essentially the teams were made up of of players from the the, the four main centres: uh, Cape Town, uh, the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg in particular, uh, Natal, and uh, Durban, and and Port Elizabeth, um, and and those centres were all themselves quite uh, uh, quite well. Uh, insulated from engagement with each other, while there were curry cup, so-called curry cup tournaments between uh, between players in South Africa, uh, white players in South Africa, they they were not particularly regular. Uh, they were also not particularly organised. Not everybody played everybody else, so there was there was a limited amount of engagement between the colonies, uh, and therefore the results as to who was actually selected tended to rely pretty heavily, as it did in the UK on the whims of the people who were running the operation, in South Africa's case, in terms of uh, the whims of uh, of Abe Bailey, uh, who was primarily responsible for South African cricket over this period. Uh, in the UK, just, just to add, sorry, I should have mentioned in the UK to come back to that bit. Uh, the UK, of course, were very much, uh, were very much a, a, a team which was essentially based around the amateurs or so-called amateurs uh, who, who uh, who put the who put the game to put the team together, uh, and uh, and and the the question then was what's the balance going to be between professionals and amateurs uh, in all of those sides? And one of the, the particular the particular issues around that whole period was that uh, was was that the, first of all how how are these things funded? Uh, who got paid? Uh, and of course. Uh, there were three categories really. There were amateurs uh, who, the likes of Lord Hawke, fell into that category. Basically, couldn't play cricket, but were were pretty much uh, were pretty keen on 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 the imperial side of the uh, of the equation. They were chamateurs, which was where most uh, non-professionals, the category most non-professionals, fell into, which were people like. C. Aubrey Smith. Walter Reed was the, the obvious, the other obvious candidate, along with his Aussie mates, Bill, uh, Billy Murdoch and, and, and Jack Ferris. Uh, they, were, uh, they, they were very much in the Shamatic category. Um, and, and, uh, therefore, and, and the last category were the, the actual professionals themselves, who were, who were essentially professionals with, recognized as such within the English county system. Uh, South Africans invited teams over, and they always looked to have as many amateurs in the team as possible because they saw their chances of competing as much greater when you were playing against amateurs, for one reason. For another reason, they saw that as an indication of their own position in the imperial social hierarchy and the fact that they wanted to, they wanted to play against amateurs uh, who, were, who, who ultimately were the, the you know the yardstick against which they they judged themselves. Uh, you know imperialism and the, the snobbish nature of imperial society uh, wasn't limited to to England and India and other places. It was very much alive and well in South Africa and covered covered a lot of this. And it had something to do with Rhodes uh, and and the, the establishment's decision to keep out black players. Uh, racism was social as well as economic, although the grounds of ultimate grounds were economic. That last point you make about the rudimentary state of representative cricket in South Africa seems to me a pretty important one. I wonder, had it attained to the level of, say, and I mean the level of interest and of professionalism, of, say, the, the county championship or the Sheffield Shield, might there not have been a greater interest in securing the likes of Crom Hendricks or in making an exception for him? Do you ever wonder about what effect on South Africa's political history a more professionalized sporting environment might have had? Yes, I, I mean it's it's an interesting speculation. I, I think 
uh, you know, but I, I've certainly argued throughout throughout this that the uh, it's it's the essence of of South Africa's downfall is based on the essence of decisions made around segregation and the racism, uh, both socio and economic, uh, which has driven the way South Africa has been essentially developed following the discovery of minerals, diamonds, and and, and gold in 1886. Uh, and the result of that has 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 meant that South Africa has moved in a particular direction, which cricket, in some ways, has exemplified. And cricket has been the cricket has been the kind of mechanism uh, where that kind of relationship has developed. But I don't. I think if one looks at it from the other perspective, which is to say, okay, if there were a lot of players playing professionally in South Africa, would that have uh, would that have changed? Would we then have had a significant number of of teams which were ultimately professionals with a few uh, a few well they would they would almost inevitably of course in this current system be white amateurs uh, and and black professionals the way the game kind of developed in the west indies uh, would we have a would we have a different kind of society as a result um i think i think the answer is well we would uh, i think there are reasons why it didn't develop like that and one of the reasons of course is that south africa is a really big place and as I mentioned earlier, teams didn't play each other very much, and it was very localized and very regional. And the opportunities—it wasn't like the county championship where you could get on a, you could you, you could get on a train, a steam engine, or whatever, and you could be in the other, you know, from one end of the country to the other overnight. And that wasn't that was never going to be possible in South Africa. So the amount of time it took to get from one place to another to play first-class cricket meant that a professional championship of that kind was never really an option and in fact it didn't really become an option option until about around the 1920s it was a it was a pretty late while there was always a curry cup the actual uh, a, a proper competition where every where all teams play each other in the same number of games and so on um that that, that was a pretty late development and it was a late development simply because of the physical structure of the of the country but on the professional side of things just, just one before you do point. interesting speculation what the historian jeffrey blaney in australia calls the tyranny yes. of distance i mean australia is also a, a humongous country and yeah. yet they don't seem to have been quite so stifled well no but it's it's, it's australia is not quite such a humongous country if you just look at it in terms of the the East Coast, and and you look at South Australia. I suppose the main South question Wales. at the time was was really just the proximity of New South Wales and Victoria, and exactly. and the and the latter was a part of the former until they started playing against each other. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you if you add in Perth, yes, of course, uh, but but without I mean, but Perth Perth happens a lot later, uh, as even Queensland happens some distance some some time later, and Tasmania. Uh, later than that, so so yes, it's, I think the tyranny of distance works in both of these in both of these these uh, situations. But I was just going to say on the professional side of this, the professional thing is interesting because one of the um, on the the second tour, one of the one of the main reasons that there was a, a single game played by the Cape Malays against uh, Walter Reed's professionals because they didn't. Walter Reed's amateurs, of course, wouldn't have dreamed of playing against black players in, in this, at Newlands and, and the the premier uh, the premier ground in South Africa. Um, that game that game took place primarily because of the close relationships between the English touring professionals and particularly people like Frank Hearn, who'd now settled in Cape Town, who'd been a tourist in the previous tour, but he was settled in Cape Town, and the uh, uh, and, and and the Cape Malay community, in fact. At the beginning of that tour, when they arrived, uh, when the tourists arrived in South Africa, the professionals were all invited to a uh, uh, to a Cape Malay wedding within a couple of days of landing, and they all went along to a, a wedding, essentially within the the black community, uh, with the with fellow professionals, because there were black professionals like Hendrix, but they were net bowlers, so they didn't play uh, in in any organised. They couldn't play in establishment cricket. And that was always the line is that they couldn't do that either club or province or indeed country but they did play as net bowlers uh and 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 therefore there was a there was a sense of a professional community so professionalism might have developed uh in the way you suggest that if it had yes we might have had a different situation we might have had a, a national team which was composed of which was colorblind um but 
but it was stamped on right at the start by by Rhodes and the fact that uh, and around the whole Hendrix issue. It's inevitable, as I think much of our foregoing conversation shows, when you're writing about colonial and apartheid South Africa, that the question of race will be to the fore. But as you also show, class was a recurrent theme as well. A, a passage I, I really liked uh, from the book, class was at the heart of the English game. Although race could trump class, as the stories of Ranjit Sinji and Dulip Sinji, not English outliers demonstrate. And then, of course, on the other hand, despite their pigmentation, it should be said, both Duleep and Ranji enjoyed in England the status of amateurs, a higher status with greater privilege than their white professional co-evils. So perhaps you'd like to tease out that irony and maybe a few others. Of course, as you say, I mean, we have a really fascinating interaction between uh, between class and race. And if, when, you look at the, when you look at the class system, Clearly, anybody who uh, comes out of uh, out of the the Indian uh, the the Indian ruling class, in the sense of being rulers of Indian states, uh, is pretty high up on the on the class structure, even in the context of of Victorian England. Um, but in the context of that, there are still nonetheless people who see uh, the role of of people like Ranjit Singhji, and let's talk about Ranjit first of all in the 1890s. I mean, Ranjit had spent some time trying to get into the England side uh, and found it very difficult to do so because Ranjit was, uh, was blocked. And Ranjit was blocked, first of all, by Harris, who was extremely reluctant to, who'd been governor of Bombay, and he was extremely reluctant to see uh, Indians playing for England, uh, no matter how good they were and how they were qualified. Uh, he was supported in that by Lord Hawke, who had very little brain of his own and just tended to go along with uh, with, with social uh, currents of these kinds, and he clearly had a, had a, had a view of, of society to the, to the right of Attila the Hun. Uh, and, and it was only because, Ranji only played because W.G. Grace put his foot down. And Grace said, Grace said, I, I, I need Ranji in my team. I've got to have Ranji. I've got to have Reggie my team. So uh, it was it was W. G. Grace. He was a shamateur. He wasn't uh, of England ruling class, if you like, stock as such. He wasn't a true amateur. Uh, his father was a, a medical doctor, as had C. Aubrey Smith's father was a doctor, and indeed the children of doctors and vicars, uh, as shamateurs, uh, are, are are pretty significant in the course of of this whole process with regard to who is an amateur and who isn't an English cricket. But Ranji Ranji himself got through through the system because of his uh, because because of because of of grace. And once he did, uh, he was pretty well. Uh, he was pretty well undroppable. He was simply that good. Um, Dulip, who was his nephew, of course, uh, Dulip Sinji, uh, played the first test in, in 1929 against South Africa. Uh, didn't do particularly well, made 12 and, and, and a single figure score, um, but was nonetheless clearly a, a, a extreme, extraordinary talent in himself and, and had already demonstrated just how good he was. And had he been anybody else, he would have been persevered with. The South African management uh had a few whispers behind the scenes within uh within the lord's hierarchy and the next thing we knew uh Dulip was dropped he didn't never went on a tour to south africa he didn't play any more tests in that series um and while he had a test career which was stellar and indeed he averaged 58 i think he had a, a stellar career um he never played against south africa again so but Dulip nonetheless still play had had was seen uh, by the 1920s, early 30s, as somebody who could play for England. Some controversy over that in, in England, and not everybody agreed with that. But again, it was a question of, of there was so much talent there, it was extremely difficult to, to, to drop him. But you could drop him if he was playing against South Africans. Of course, we knew the South Africans wouldn't like him. What I'm saying there, in other words, is that ultimately class uh, class is what is, is fundamental to all of this, but uh, but but of course, in the relationship between race and class, is is extremely convoluted. It's a bit of a uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a, a double helix. You know, the whole the whole the interwoven nature of of personal prejudice, uh, the prejudice that is necessary because to to drive a, a, a labour system, 
and to drive an eco a, a, a capitalist economy in, in, in somewhere like South Africa. And the relationship between that and, and how, uh, how the, the economics and the, and the social structure of the country's work is, is so complex. But these are two these these two things move push in the same direction. They're not antithetical in any way, and certainly in South Africa, race and class are mutually reinforcing and still are. The story of Dulip Sinji and the story of the South African cricket authorities' interference in his Test match career will strike some discordant notes, uh, some uncomfortable echoes for people familiar with the saga of Basil D'Oliveira in later years. It's often thought that things only came to a head with the intransigence of the Nats, but well before the Nats were around, as you've just shown, this issue was rearing its head. Perhaps you'd like to say a bit about those two episodes and uh, the light they shed on one another. Sure. Um, yes, I, I think that's. I think the point is that really all the way back to you know this thing starts in the 1890s and there's a trajectory through from the 1890s for 75 years through to Basil D'Oliveira and the whole nature of of the South African class system and the, the question of racism within the within in cricketing terms goes goes through that whole process and what it, what ends up with D'Oliveira is is not simply to do with either the intransigence of the mcc or the intransigence of of john forster uh in in south africa but is is basically baked into the relationship between south africa and and, uh, and, and england by the time you get to favor so south africa um, let's let's just pick it up from from the dulip perspective uh dulip with regard to dulip the English do what South Africa wants. It's not. It's not kind of. It's not acceptable from South Africa's point of view to be playing against publicly playing against some guy who in South Africa is not a, 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 a is not a citizen of the country. He's not allowed to be a citizen because he's black, essentially. So the South Africans by the 1960s, uh, where this whole thing has become where apartheid has, has moved on from being a system of essentially of, of segregation and, and with a with with a basic race and class component has become a, a an ideological superstructure which is based rooted in the whole economic relationships between uh Afrikaner society uh the mining industry and and you know and the the, the, the movement of south africa as a whole uh apartheid is apartheid is a, a, a fundament a fundamentally a uh, different level to the kind of segregation that we're talking about every aspect of the lives of of black south africans whatever 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 genus of black south africans they are but all every uh, every aspect of south africa uh, of black south africans lives are determined by uh, by apartheid laws there are hundreds literally hundreds of, lo of laws apartheid laws about what you can't do very few about what you can do but what you can't do if you're black in south africa by the by the time of the by the 1960s so to come into dolivera then uh what happens essentially with with regard to dolivera is dolivera escaped south africa um despite a captain south africa uh, the south african non European, as it was called in in those days. In other words, the black South African team. He played for, he captained them against Kenya, um, against a, a Kenyan Asian team uh, in the in the 1950s. Uh, he was clearly a, an outstanding player. Came over as a professional, as we all know, uh, and uh, and then joined uh, joined Worcestershire uh, and was selected in in 1966 for for England. Um, and that in itself was a uh, an interesting uh, an interesting change in the way uh, that English society was prepared to to look at uh, to look at cricketers to look at black cricketers. And there'd be very few, of course, black cricketers playing. We, we talked about two: Ranji and Dulip. Uh, the Nama of Patori, perhaps who falls into exactly the same category, uh, was another one. Uh, and Raymond Sabaro, who played for England, uh, was another one. But they were all essentially in the same category. They were all uh, from the Indian subcontinent. They were all uh, extreme in the cl in class terms. They were at the top of the uh, the class pyramid. Dolivera wasn't any of those things. He was uh, he was so-called coloured South African. He was uh, 
he was black he wasn't uh he wasn't of a he was a professional he wasn't of a significant uh his class origins were were uh, pretty poor uh he came from exactly the same origins as crom hendrix had 75 years before and in fact he grew up 200 yards away from where hendrix had uh, had played uh of course he'd never heard of crom hendrix because by that stage no one knew anything about crom hendrix He's, he'd been airbrushed out of cricketing history so Dolivier uh, was chosen for England. And as soon as he was chosen for England, uh, there were a number of mutterings started to happen in South Africa. But at the same time, what, what also went on was uh, South Africa in, in 1966, uh, there was a, an all black side was due to tour South Africa, play rugby and, and South Africans generally uh, were far keener on rugby than they were on cricket. It was a much more, uh, uh, much more sort of for what for a lot of complicated reasons had become the national game in a in a way that cricket cricket never quite never had um so there was so but the all black tour was was cancelled um because they wanted to bring a black player uh the all blacks south africa's uh, amari south africa said no you can't and uh, and the blue all blacks pulled the tour so South Africa then said, well, maybe we'll think about this a little bit. And South Africa then thought, then decided to play a, a, a different kind of game with this, uh, without being making their, making their positions a little more murky and putting the onus on the other side. They realized this would be a public relations disaster. In fact, several, uh, several ministers resigned from the uh, ministers resigned from the cabinet over issues related to this, the significance of of of, uh, of rugby. So, the the with regard to Dolivera in England, there were already some tentative investigations went on from the time he first started playing for England about what would happen two and a half years later, in uh, with regard to this tour to South Africa, and it was a long uh, and complicated saga, but. For one reason or another, Dennis Howell, the uh, Minister of Sport, uh, Labour Minister of Sport in the uh, in in the mid in '66, uh, said that the MCC wouldn't accept a team uh, which wasn't which they didn't have complete uh, authority over selection. So, in other words, South Africa couldn't select the the team for uh, the team the team to, to tour. The MCC were less happy about this than uh, than than. Uh, than the minister for sport had been, um, and and they formed a they formed a little group to try and manage this over over what became a two year period, uh, set up directly within the the MCC committee, a little cabal made up mainly of of uh, Alec Douglas Hume, uh, of of um, of uh, Arthur Gilligan, uh, who was president of the MCC at the time, and that Douglas Hume had been the previous president. Uh, and then, uh, and then the the Gubby Allen, the treasurer, and and Billy Griffith, the the secretary, and they were essentially running this. How do we deal with South Africa process? Um, there was lots of diplomatic stuff went on uh, to do mainly with things like uh, the MCC sent a letter to South Africa saying, uh, "Do you agree that it's okay for us to select the team, whichever team we want?" South Africa said, "We've received your letter. Thank you very much." Uh, but didn't comment on the issue. And South Africa were, were very reluctant to get involved with the issue. So the politics of it chunted on until the, the summer of the, the ashes summer of 1968. First test, Dolivera plays, makes top score. In fact, they only played about 50, makes 89, not out. Um, and, uh, and then critical things happen immediately after that. It becomes clear at that point that Dolivera is a real threat. The likelihood is that he will tour South Africa. Uh, so South Africa, South Africa sends over, John Forster sends over the head of the South African Cricket Association, Arthur Coy, to try and deal with this in the MCC and figure out what they can do. So nine days later, there's a test at Lords. Uh, first of all, Coy, then Billy Griffith, and then Jim Swanton all go and see Dolivera separately. And all say to him, "Look, you've got to withdraw. The tour won't go ahead. There's no point in you in, in you being, you know, being part of this because if you're selected, the tour will the tour simply won't go ahead. You need to withdraw gracefully. There's plenty of money on the table. There's coaching contracts. There's all sorts of stuff we can give you. 
And by the way, why don't you go and play? Why don't you play for South Africa instead of playing for England? Which was the sort of the last, the final insult to you know to to as part of this you know this extremely unpleasant process. Uh, Dolivira, Dolivira, of course, throws him out, um, and and but he nonetheless and he's dropped. He's dropped on the morning of the game, despite his performance in the previous test. He's uh, he's left out, and he's left out for the rest of the summer. Uh, until we until the final test, and then uh, and the book goes into some detail as to how he ends up being selected for the final test. But it's a series of it's a series of uh, essentially uh, essential essentially serendipitous events happen. Um, one is he's brought in as a bowler, uh, and then uh, and then finally uh, Roger Prido uh, is forced out by a virus on the day of the game, and the, the, the circumstances are all quite well known. Um, and and he he of course makes 158. It's the wins the Ashes for uh, for England. I mean it's it's one of the the crucial innings uh, in English cricket history. And within three hours, Colin Cowdery is at Lords. The, the matches at the Oval. The, the game finishes. Uh, the matches. Uh, the, the, the the team is celebrating. Uh, Colin Cowdery has has got in, jumped into his Jag. Uh, it is at Lords for a selection meeting for the tour to South Africa. Now that the test is over, and they they know they have to deal with this. Colin Cardry himself uh, has his own views on whether uh, Dolivera should be selected or not. But there's a long and complicated six-hour selection meeting. Uh, the upshot of that is that his name and and the book goes into details of how that how that ran. Uh, his name is not in the in the touring in the touring party, and of course we all know that that went down pretty badly with the press and, in fact, with everybody. Um, and then finally, uh, after another series of incidents to do with uh, to do with Tom Cartwright and his availability or otherwise, uh, we end up in, and with Dolivera being selected as, as a replacement. At which point the South Africans say, "Sorry, we're uh, we're we're not." We're not very keen on on this. Um, you know, this looks like the tour of the anti-apartheid movement to us. But they don't say you can't tour. They just say we don't like the look of this. And eventually, England and the MCC are forced to to uh, to cancel the tour uh, as a result of as a result of this. And there's a, a the, the, what happens is the MCC decide. Okay, what we'll do is we'll abandon this tour, but we'll keep our relationship. So if we if we pull out of the tour, we can get another tour. They can come to us in 1970. We can keep the thing going. If we push it to the limit, if we take Dolivera now, it's, it's, uh, it, it could be the end of our relationship with, uh, with South Africa. So they hung on till the bitter end to keep that relationship going in the same way that they'd, you know, they'd done it for 75 years. And that was, uh, that was the essence of it. But of course, from South Africa's point of view, there was no way they would have a, a black player coming and playing a black South African player coming and playing for the opposition. That was completely outside anything white South Africa was prepared to, to accept and, and, and indeed was, you know, never likely to change until, of course, we got a complete change of regime. You'll have to forgive me that my questions aren't really flowing into one another. My next one is about cricket and nation building. A great deal has been said in the case again of Australia about the effect of that country's early cricketing triumphs on the establishment of an Australian national identity and ultimately an Australian nation. There's been relatively little on this subject about the same phenomenon at work in South Africa, perhaps because in South Africa's case it was a lot more um, explicit and self-conscious. Uh, you tell us, for example, that Henry Lucent Gore's brief in 1909-10, uh, I'm quoting now, was to reinforce the English requirement for a strong and loyal union, an ideal, incidentally, that was consummated uh, almost as the England team were leaving that summer. In fact, you quote uh, William Schreiner at the MCC's farewell banquet on how South Africans were as united in sport as they were politically and how in achieving this they owed a great deal to the MCC. Again, I have no particular question here. I'd like you to riff on that point a bit. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I think the, the best way to... I mean, I think there are just two points you need to know. First of all, that, that 10 years before that, we've had the Anglo-Boer War, uh, and, and 180,000 people died uh, over, a, over a three-year period. And it was a war fought, essentially, to, to determine control over the gold mining industry. Uh, and and it was won by 
it was run by the, the UK and the UK shareholders essentially in the uh, in the in the in the mines, uh, and and a number of things happened as a result of that. Uh, but but not to go into too much detail about that now. The second area was that partly because the mining industry essentially had been uh, had been victorious in the war, what it meant what it meant was that the uh, relationship between black and white in the in south africa was pretty well determined by the labor requirements of the of the um of the the state and particularly the mining industry specifically and therefore as as black south africans saw it and indeed quite rightly uh, they were sold down the river and they were sold down the river from from the very start that the, the Brits totally, totally betrayed them. In fact, several delegations went, including one with, with William Schreiner, who you quoted earlier, um, and several delegations went to uh, went to the to 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 Britain to the the House of, uh, the House of Commons and so on, uh, and to plead their case, uh, and were always told that in fact they couldn't do anything about it. It was down to the government of of a new union, South Africa. Now, of course. The, the, while there was still some opportunity in one of the one part of South Africa in the Cape for for Black South Africans to vote, uh, it was it, it was extremely high property requirements and it also required a number of different cultural aspects, which meant that the there were only a tiny number of of Black South Africans could vote. But nonetheless, there were some. Beyond that, uh, there was it, it, voting was done on a on a on a basically a racial basis. So the, the union of South Africa and the political union of all sectors of the community uh, and the, the, the unity of the races, as was, it was often referred to in South Africa at the time, meant the unity of the English and Afrikaner races. It didn't mean anything to do with black South Africans and indeed black South Africans had almost no say in it. And, and very soon after union, the, the, what was known as the Native Land Act was passed, which essentially provided for uh, the vast majority of the land to, to be uh, only available to, to, to whites and to be held in white hands. And that became one of the fundamental bases for apartheid a long time later. So in terms of nation building, uh, yes, there was a nation being built, but it was a white South African nation being built. Uh, and it was, it didn't mean it wasn't edgy. And indeed, there was a fight all the way through between, um, not so much just between Afrikaner and English, but between labor and capital, uh, which was pretty fun, black, uh, between white labor and, and, and capital in particular. Or the, the, for example, um, radical white labor in the 1920s, uh, the, the Wobblies, uh, the IWW, had a, had a slogan in South Africa which said, you, you know, workers of the world unite and fight for a white South Africa. Uh, so that was where they were coming from. So the labor capital thing was within that racial parameter if you like uh, that was taken for granted and indeed indeed the worst violence of a lot of industrial violence took place between white workers and black workers and uh, not necessarily between capitalists although roads would i'm oh, sorry the smuts would get the troops out and and, and had no uh, no difficulty of shooting uh, shooting black workers when it was uh, when it was necessary cricket likes to praise itself or to congratulate itself on the sheer quantity of its literature but i think it has cause to feel a little bit bashful especially of late about its general quality i recently read a piece matthew engel wrote in wisdom cricket monthly in 1999 which i think can't be improved upon for this line he says cricket histories get written well received widely read and sometimes even win awards when the writer has done damn all except flick through a few old books. Uh, I think any fair-minded reader of your book would acknowledge that you and Prof. Urdendahl have done rather more than flick through a few old books. Let me, let me quote from my abandoned review for the cricket statistician. I said something along the lines of, you've probed the bowels of time, shifted the shit from the undigested billion and poured life into the jaws of chapfallen scholarship. Perhaps it's fortunate I got no further than that. Um, You're going to have to send me a copy of that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, 
That's a slightly empurpled way of saying that every chapter contains or is itself a revelation. My favorite discovery in the early ones was of the journalism of Charlie Findlayson, uh, which to my knowledge has never appeared between the covers of a book before, but which on the evidence of your selections uh, makes him a contender with, say, Tom Horan as cricket's greatest player journalist. <laughs> well, Charlie Findlayson was, Charlie, as I say, Charlie Findlayson was a uh, was a real character, and he was uh, his view um, from was was as a, as a as South African nationalist, as somebody who saw South Africans, and by South Africans, of course, he meant white South Africans, to be uh, to to be equal and ready to challenge uh, the English uh, in every sphere of society. And he he had what you could think of as a kind of Australian mentality in this. South Africans on the whole were trying to be more like the English or white South Africans, white English speaking South Africans. Whereas Finlayson took a different line. And Finlayson's, Finlayson's journalism uh, was excoriating with regard to the, uh, first of all, with regard to the first English tour uh, C. Aubrey Smith's tour, uh, which played a couple of games uh, in Kimberley. Uh, and, and indeed, Finlayson himself was a, an exceptional cricketer. He played for South Africa during that series. So not only was he uh, was he an exceptional journalist uh, writing, uh, you know, write, writing contemporaneous material, but he was also a um, he, he was all, he was also uh, you know playing an absolutely key role in the test matches themselves. Uh, he was the bowler mainly, uh, that a bit, but essentially he was a bowler and he his his uh, he was a quick bowler, a very strange action. Uh, who also bowled a moon ball. Uh, in other words, he would lob it up as high as it would go uh, and try to land it on top of the studs in a sort of spinning uh, dropper type uh, approach. So, but he was a real character, and he he managed to totally insult the uh, Aubrey Smith's England team in while they were in Kimberley, uh, and and uh, and created a, a significant incident. Um, but was a uh, ultimately through this whole period was the essentially the speaker of truth in the country. He was he was quite prepared to say what uh, what the situation really was, and and as a journalist, uh, uh, particularly as a cricket journalist, in fact. His his cricket descriptions are remarkable, and he writes like a modern cricket writer. Uh, he just doesn't have the anything like the stuffy, overwordy, um, you know, it, it, establishment kind of speak that that other cricket writers at the time had. He was a real a real character, well ahead of his time. His racial views debatable. Um, he wasn't necessarily in favor of Hendrix, and he didn't say too much about Hendrix. Uh, he's mainly, I think, because his main rival was a guy called Harry Cadwallader, who was Hendrix's main supporter. And Cadwallader, Cadwallader was pro Hendrix, and therefore uh, one can see that, that Finlayson, Charlie Finlayson, would be, uh, would be fairly anti Hendrix as a result. But in fact, he says very little about it about Hendrix in the period. Another revelation in your book, I think we'll work through a few of those for a while, shall we? Uh, the recurrent connections between the MCC and the Rand mining industry. It turns out that for all the noble sounding rhetoric of the likes of Lord Harris and Plum Warner, their motives at times look a little less missionary and a little more mercenary, don't they? In broad terms, one sees this whole nation, notion of the imperial mission and cricket being uh, having this great ideological power to uh, you know this higher this higher purpose if you like uh, and that's spoken about you know through millions of words endlessly about what the empire was supposed to do and the elevating factor of this game and so on but the 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 point about it was that it was used very much as a whatever the the whatever the, the nature of cricket itself is. And I mean, frankly, I'm quite pragmatic about what cricket is. I think it's a wonderful game, but I don't think it has anything beyond that to it. It's a, what, just a wonderful game. Uh, I don't give it, I don't describe to it any kind of major social or, or other, con, you know, other, other direction apart from the context that it's played within. So, so the real revelation, the real revelation, and, and there, are, there are several revelations I hope in this book. Um, one of them, of course, being around the whole Dolivera question uh, and the, the availability of materials for Dolivera and so on. We might come on to that at some point. We, we will. Um, okay. But the other, the, the, the revelation in this was that 
cricket, cricket essentially was run in the UK by Lord Harris uh, with the, the unthinking support of Lord Hawke. And I say the unthinking support because I don't think he was capable of doing a great deal of thinking. But, but Lord Harris was uh, started off, of course, as England's captain. Uh, during the riots in, in in Sydney in 1879, it was Lord Harris who was the uh, he was the he was the captain of the England team. He became a minister in the Conservative government. He became governor of of Mumbai, Bombay, of course, uh, and and uh, then he became in the in the 1890s he became chairman of the MCC for a year. It was only a year as uh, a president, sorry, of the MCC. It was it was uh, it was just for a year's uh, job as it is now. Um, and then became by by the end of this period became treasurer of the MCC, which is the real position of power within the MCC. And it was treasurer from the end of the 1890s through to just before his death in the 1930s. Uh, so for 30 odd years, Lord Harris controlled English cricket. Uh, he also happened to control the South African gold mines. He was the uh, he was the chairman of consolidated gold fields, which was the major conglomerate operating in, in on the South African gold mines in the Florida And he was he was uh, he was chairman of that from the again the late 1890s to the 1930s. So throughout this period, Lord Harris had in his hand and he's he's spoken of everywhere as the most influential man in England English cricket. Uh, Barclays World of Cricket, I think, describes him as such. But he's also the most the most influential man post Rhodes, who Rhodes is dead by 1902. So post Rhodes in the South African mining environment as well. But of course, you you read any biography of Lord Harris, and there are a couple, and nobody mentions the fact that he's got anything to do with the South African mining industry. What like you mean Morris. to say is that there are a couple of hagiographies about Lord Harris. I do. I, well, I couldn't possibly say that though, because everybody, you have to respect everybody who tries to write a book about stuff like this. But anyway, no. The point is that Harris, of course, yes, Harris, Harris's primary goal was the the relationship or the in, primary driver was the interaction between cricket and his chairmanship of of consolidated gold fields. So that's that's interesting to start with. But then let's look at let's look at the guy who controlled South African cricket. Now, Abe Bailey started off uh, in, in played for Transvaal in the early 1890s um, and uh, uh, was also became uh, was involved heavily involved in the in the Jamison uh, the Jamison raid of 1896 was sentenced to death by Kruger's government uh, and uh, in in 18 in 1896 and was in jail um, and uh, and in the meantime, had organised the Lord Hawks tour to uh, to to South Africa in in again 1896-7. And uh, and and Bailey himself Bailey himself was became was was essentially the leader of the from the eighteen early mid 1890s onwards was the leader of the South African uh, mining industry on the ground. He was the CEO effectively to. Harris's chair to Harris's chairman, uh, and he controlled that through to into the 1920s. Um, so so Bailey Bailey was ran South African cricket at the same time. He ran South African cricket. He ran and he ran the mines on the ground. Harris ran ran English cricket and ran the mines. You know, in, in the broader uh, on the broader directorial uh, stage. So ultimately into the boardroom and so on. So ultimately, South African cricket and South African mining are totally, completely, inextricably intertwined. It goes back further, of course, because Cecil Rhodes, who started this whole kerfuffle going with Hendrix and the fact that Hendrix couldn't, couldn't play for South Africa, was the, the arch imperialist and the arch capitalist who uh, not only completely controlled the Kimberley diamond mining industry before there was such a thing as gold, but also had a major role to play in the South African gold mining industry after gold was discovered, um, and and so between them, cricket, and and cricket and economics and cricket and the mining industry are fundamentally connected in South Africa. So, when to talk about you know I make no uh, you know I make no excuse for talking about politics in in terms of South African cricket. In fact, I don't know how you can write about South African cricket without describing all of this. This is this is so fundamental to what happens on the pitch and around the pitch that, that 
you know, you simply can't write about it otherwise. It's, it's, South African cricket is based ultimately on who plays, who doesn't play, where they play, how they play, is all down to that broader relationship. Finally, the biggest revelation of the book, the Dolla Vera affair. You have found the missing MCC minutes for the selection panel in 1968. Tell us yes. how you found them and what they reveal. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I found it a number of, of, of minutes uh, to do with the MCC uh, and the MCC selection committees and the, uh, the MCC committee of, itself, as well as its subcommittee, which was the selection committee, going back from, from 1966. And part of the reason I talk about this, what I, what I call in terms of in shorthand terms, is a cabal being set up to manage Dolivier, the Dolivera issue, is because that appears in the minutes of the uh, of the, the the committee of the MCC committee, they 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 essentially uh, they outsource this problem to to this to this group to to manage. So I looked at the I looked at the minutes through of the uh, of the cricket of the MCC committee and all the subsidiary committees that I could find, including including the selection and cricket committees. Um, how did I find them? I just asked for them. Uh, they were they they were listed in the um, on on in the MCC catalogue uh, and uh, which was quite which was quite well organised and I I found them in there I did I took a little bit of digging but I did some digging and I found them in there uh, and I asked the uh, I asked the the archivist uh, to let me see them and and he happily let me see them and I spent a, a very interesting couple of days going through them and and. Uh, Working out exactly what was being said throughout this period. So my, my if I my, may, the, the question this raises is, why had no one else found them before? Why were they presumed lost? Well, I, I, I think there, I think there are sort of three potential explanations for this. One is that, uh, is, is that the cataloging system has had or has changed, uh, and it's become more, uh, become better. Um, and, and I did ask the archivist about this, and he said, "Well, no, not in certainly not in the as far as he was aware, uh, there hadn't been any significant changes to to the MCC catalogue. They were quite hard to uh, they were quite hard to interrogate. At, at uh, they, they tended to be on on microfiche uh, and not very logical in terms of the way they were they were put together. But as a historian, well, you learn to deal with stuff like that. So." Um, that that was that was one possibility. The other possibility is that everybody just believed the fact that once somebody had said they couldn't find them, they and the chances were because of the degree of of iniquity that went on here that their laws had probably just destroyed them. Kind of everybody seemed to go along with that, and uh, and and just oh well, you know they're not going to be there. And that most of the stuff that's written about Dolivera has been written by journalists who tend to to look at contemporaneous sources but don't necessarily go dig down into archival material and i think that was probably a reason for that that was probably the the, the second main the second main reason you find when um, you interrogate a lot of cricket's foundational myths that all, all it takes is for one chap to assert that such and such is the case uh, for everyone yeah. else to follow suit uncritically for centuries absolutely Absolutely, that's exactly what happens, and that happened. I mean, that happened with the whole Hendrix thing, for one thing. So, um, you know, it 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 was a matter of it was a matter of. I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not pretending any great uh, you know any great sort of expertise on this. I'm just suggesting that that a, a little bit of slightly forensic, slightly dogged kind of digging into this gave provided a great deal of information one wouldn't otherwise have but the second part of your question was to say what was in it well you can you can let me let me just go with the rather than the the, the book does go into detail across all of this but let me just focus on the selection committee meeting itself on the uh, on the night of uh, on, on the night of I think it was the 28th of August, I can't remember, the last day of the, the Oval Test. But as I've suggested, Colin Cardry drove back from the Oval to Lords for this for this meeting, along with uh, along with Jack Bailey, the uh, MCC Assistant Secretary, and uh, and and said and gave his views to Jack Bailey in the car. And Jack Bailey records them in his, his autobiography. 
uh, quite interesting in themselves. Anyway, so they go into this meeting. Uh, we have a we have the minutes. And our minutes are the wrong word. They're described as minutes, but they're entirely the wrong word for this. Um, I, I've been, I've done a bit of bureaucracy in my time, and, uh, and these are not minutes. But these are a, a best a, a summary record, terse in the extreme, of of the decisions that were taken. So we had a six-hour meeting, and that ran to just a little over six hours. Uh, as the minutes themselves uh, say, you know, we st started at eight and they ended up at, you know, just just past, uh, just after 2 a.m. Uh, and the time's in the minutes. But it's a one page, it's a one page note. And it says, it says, you know, the team, the, there was plenty of discussion about the team and this is essentially the team that they came up with. And says very little about anything else, says nothing about Dolly Vera. Uh, and essentially, and about gives a list of the of the players who first of all said that you know uh, uh, I think it was uh, Jack Jones needed to be uh, his fitness needed to be assessed. They had a, they needed to bring in an extra fast bowler and they needed to decide who that fast bowler would be. But it completely ignores the entire question of Dolivier. There was nothing in the minutes at all. So one has to read between the lines as to what actually happened in that meeting. And I have one other bit of of evidence which has helped me develop a, a, my, uh, I suppose, a theory is too strong a word, but uh, <laughs> how I see the events of the of that night and indeed the whole process taking place. And that's that uh, in, in, um, in Mike Brearley's uh, book on the spirit of cricket, he, uh, talk, he mentions how an MCC member um, spoke to him about Doug Insull and Doug in, whether Doug Insull uh, had uh, had you know said uh, had gone along with the decision or not gone along with the decision and so on. Um, I uh, I Doug Insel being chairman of the selection committee. Uh, I uh, I found I found this person um, again a little bit of digging on that uh, and uh, and I name him in the book. Uh, his name his name is David Allison. And I, I spoke to David and and had a couple, an interview with him and discussed what had, what how he had come to this point. And he told me that he'd had a he, he was a friend of Doug Insoles. They used to go to the Carol the Carol concert every year at the MCC together and so on. Um, and they both like jazz and you know all that sort of thing. And and he had he had uh, so he had quite a close sort of connection with him over over quite a number of years. Uh, and he asked him, he'd been to a meeting at the Cricket Society where the Dolivera question had been discussed. Uh, he was he was left unsatisfied by all of this. Uh, and he and he asked Doug Insull, in the year or so before he died, he asked Doug Insull uh, what, had, what had happened. And, uh, you know, Doug Insull had always said, oh, well, we hadn't we hadn't picked him. It was unanimous and we hadn't picked him because we didn't we behaved badly in the West Indies and we didn't think he'd be the right person to go, which was clearly, I mean, there are all sorts of, the book demonstrates all the reasons, the arguments, how all of that was essentially, uh, essentially word on. Um, but then the uh, the question then is, is okay, so so what did you, what did you do? And, and Doug Insull said, well, actually we selected him and the, uh, and we, but we were told by the, the MCC officials that, uh, that we couldn't, that, that this would be the end of the tour, and we couldn't uh, we couldn't carry on with it in this way. Um, so anyway, so I go through this in, in quite a bit more detail in the book as to exactly how they might have got to that point and how we ended up with this. But it's, a lot of it requires reading between the lines in terms of these minutes, and also, of course, relies to to some extent on David Allison's evidence. I mean, I don't whether David Allison's right or not doesn't really matter too much because. Ultimately, I think it, the thing stands up for itself. But it's 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 a, an attempt essentially to to show how this the sequence of events actually took place, how the decision making occurred, who was involved in this, but also to link it back to seventy five years of history. You know, this is this is Crom Hendricks onwards all the way through you know this is that relationship over 75 years this is the mining industry you know this is the this is the uh you know ultimately the the mantra of of 
people controlling the mining industry. And of course, in, in South Africa, the, the white politicians may exemplified by Jan Smuts, who were very keen on the mining industry being, uh, you know, which was the essence of the South African economy. Uh, be supported particularly with regard to labor and so on and how those interests interacted and intersected the whole way through this period so effectively there was nothing else in a sense that the mcc could do it wasn't so much uh, racism and perfidy on the part of the individuals the cartel if you like involved although there was that the, the cruelty and and uh, 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 tr the treatment of dolovira is is from my point of view utterly disgusting and appalling and i can't believe that they could they could deal with a player who played for them so faithfully and so intensely uh, and contributed so much over the last three years and he was so vulnerable as well uh you know who who, who would be treated in a way like that by the mcc the sheer the sheer arrogance and cruelty is is breathtaking for me and i think that's the you know that's to me the message that comes out of this and the more you go through the minutes and the less humanity is sh that's shown in the context of these minutes the more you think you know <laughs> I, as i say it's not it's not just their fault but it's still the whole nature of that relationship it's it's symptomatic of the fact that the mcc for 75 years told turned a total blind eye not only to the fact that they weren't playing against black cricketers but also to the, the society within which they were touring and the fact that they showed no interest whatsoever in what was really going on in south africa and indeed spent the whole time trying to avoid it and i've got plenty of there's, there's plenty of material about that such as when the when peter may's tour in 1950s 1956-7 set off uh, the first just about the first thing that was done uh, they they all they all received an anonymously copies of the international defense and aid funds publication of trevor huddleston called north reverend trevor huddleston called north for your comfort which is about a pretty excoriating uh, analysis of of what it was like being black in south african townships and they uh, in the context of that uh, uh, the, the they also had a, a guy on board called called uh, Professor Tomlinson, who was uh, who was responsible for drawing up uh, apartheid ideology around the whole question of what became the homelands in due course, and this idea of breaking South Africa up into as they did into into a dozen different independent entities to make sure that only the whites could actually be South Africans. He was he was the ideologue behind that, working to Hendrik Verwoerd at the time. He was on board, and he gave the he gave the uh, the England cricketers a lecture on all of this. Uh, and Frank and and Freddie Howard, the England manager, had rounded up all the copies of North for Your Comfort and had thrown them overboard to make sure that nobody found them. That they were so they floated off in the ship's wake as they headed off to South Africa, as they headed off from from England to South Africa. And that was indicative of the relationship between the MCC and south africa that that told that told its own story um and that's that's why we ended up with dolivira in the way that we did and why he suffered the appalling cruelty I, I loved that vignette it actually opens one of your chapters doesn't it the ship leaving a, a trail of this anti-apartheid literature in its wake you know yes. very very symbolic and well judged i suppose we should say a bit about the cricket itself of course, it's less interesting than the politics, but uh, what's your favorite among the on-field episodes? I, I think everybody's favorite really has to be uh, the South Africa's first test victory. And I'm not saying that just because it was South Africa's te first test victory, it's because of the circumstances in which it happened. And that was Plum Warner's tour uh, in 1905-06, when, uh, when England, uh, Plum Warner brought over a, t uh, a team which he thought was he thought would be uh, he thought would be adequate enough to 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 beat the South Africans, um, but ran into this this googly bowler phenomenon which had begun to develop uh, following uh, Reggie Schwartz learnt learnt it from uh, from Bosenkay in in the early 1900s. Uh, Warner do you, knew a lot do you of not say, by that. the way, do you not say, by the way, that, that he picked it up on Brighton Pier? I'm, I'm was a, sure. a, I, I think you may have mentioned that. I was thrilled to see this recently. I'm pretty sure I oh. read it in your book because 
I, I myself, un, uh, unknowingly, in 2006, bowled, bowled a googly on Brighton Pier. On Brighton and, Pier. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Okay, did you get much turn? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think it might have, might have hit a crack, but, you know, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll claim it, it, fizzed, it fizzed out of the fingers beautifully. Anyway, right. sorry, right. as you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well Bozen Kay Bozen and Reggie Schwartz were very close. Um, at, at Middlesex. Uh, Reggie Schwartz was English, as, as obviously was Bozenke. Um And, and Bozenke, in fact, named his son after Reggie Schwartz, which is why we had Reggie Bozenke, the newsreader. So uh, so he was named, I don't think he bowled googlies, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, the, the, the googly bowlers were, Reggie Schwartz then taught it to the other, in 1904, taught it to the to some of the other South Africans, and you ended up with a googly quartet. All bowled things, all bowled a little differently. I mean, Schwartz just bowled googlies, uh, Faulkner bowled leggies and googlies, and and Vogler bowled a whole lot of different things as well. And Gordon White was mainly a leg break bow. But they all they formed this sort of pretty awesome quartet. Um, and and as I say, Warner was heavily involved in this because this had been put together when they when Schwartz and Bozenke paid for Middlesex. And then, of course, they'd won, they'd, won the, they'd won the Ashes with this too. So everybody was aware of all of this. But the difference was that when they came to South Africa, they were playing on uh, matting wickets, on matting on rolled gravel, on, on, on baked mud, basically. Which meant that, uh, that googlies would, would spit like cobras off the surface. Uh, it, was like, it was like bowling at Perth, but only much more so. Um, so the bounce and the trajectory and the turn was pretty, you know, was was pretty hard to uh, hard to counter. But in fact, as it uh, as it turned out, that wasn't that was in Warner's head as the the problem for the the tour. In fact, in reality, as the stats show, it was also the the seam bowlers who did the damage. In this in this particular test, the first test of the series uh, at the Wanderers and on this. On this pitch, which everybody knew to be, you know, to be absolute lightning, um, the uh, the England started lost three for fifteen, um, made one hundred and eighty odd in the first innings, uh, clawed it back. Um, South Africa then collapsed, made ninety one. Uh, Dave Norse made forty or so, dragged them to ninety one. Um, and when it came to the uh, when it came to the final, the fourth innings. Uh, South Africa needed uh, 286, I think it was, um, I'm trying to remember now, maybe, no, 284, I think, uh, to win. And now nobody had scored 200 in the game so far. So it was, uh, they were clearly in in, um, in nowhere territory. This just wasn't going to happen. They were 107 for six, uh, chasing 284. Uh, and essentially, you know, everybody had, had long since, certainly all the spectators had long since given up. I mean, even though there's still lots of betting going on, because betting was like a major thing going on in cricket grounds at that stage. Uh, nonetheless, it, it, this, this was not going to happen. And then Norse and, uh, and, and Gordon White, uh, one of the googly quartet, but actually a better batsman than a bowler, um, put, put on 120. White made an absolutely superb 81. Uh, and then uh, Alf, Alf Ralph uh, had his, uh, took, took out his off stub. Um, and they were now, and, and within, a, within a, a few overs, they were 239 for nine. Uh, at one wicket left, 45 runs to get. Uh, out strides Percy, uh, Percy Sherwell. Uh, per Percy Sherwell is South Africa's, as, as you know, South Africa's uh, tennis singles champion. So he's got some pretty good hand-eye coordination. He, he knows what he's doing. He's also South Africa's wicketkeeper uh, and South Africa's captain. Now he's had a dreadful test. It's his first test match. He's been he's been captain. Uh, he's led loads of buys through. He can't. The googly bowlers are too good for him as well as the, for the batsmen. Uh, he hasn't been able to. He hasn't been able to keep. He's he, he keeps him in. in um, you know he he hasn't been keeping to the googly bowlers. So he just he doesn't know what he's doing. His field placings are all over the place. He doesn't even get the batting order right. I mean, it's a mess. So he comes, but he comes up full of confidence uh, and uh, 45 to get, nothing to lose essentially. Um, and slowly, well, not so slowly, runs start accumulating. And as they start accumulating, Warner and Warner's team start panicking and things start going wrong. And they start, uh, 
Uh, he tries to bowl Jack Crawford, bowl two overs in a row from uh, uh, Jack Crawford, which which clearly demonstrates how how far he's lost his grip on the situation. The ball gets snicked through the slips, catchable height, miss, uh, and so on until we're down to uh, until until finally uh, the scores come to the, the scores are are, e are even. Uh, only needs one uh, one shot to win. Um, crowd by this stage have gone absolutely nuts i mean the guys have gone through the stage of biting the 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 handles off their umbrellas which is the traditional way these things are are, are done <laughs> in, in close matches in cricket grounds but the, and so the crowd are going absolutely crazy um and they have a uh they have and then uh Sherwell plays the ball back to the bowler they they there's a there's thought of going for a single they end up in kind of the middle of the pitch it was one of those yes no get back scenarios that we we're all very familiar with uh, <laughs> i've certainly been involved in more of my share of um, <laughs> and, uh, and and anyway they do they, somehow they scamper back the ball's missed it's dropped they scamper back in, into the uh, into the crease and and the next ball uh, the next ball from ralph is a long hop um and it's smashed by Sherwell towards the leg side boundary um never gets there the crowd swarm over the over the uh, over the ropes, just just totally submerge the pitch. Grab Sherwell, grab Dave Norse, who's 91 not out at this stage. Grab Dave Norse and, and carry them off. Finally, Norse gets his feet back on on solid ground and walks up the steps to the uh, up the pavilion steps to the uh, to the change the changing area. And uh, at each step on the way, there's all these these well wishes, and they're all pressing sovereigns into his palms, into his palm, and saying, you know, wow, wow, fantastic, well done. And uh, and and so he gets to the top, and he thinks, how can I get back and go up again? You know, so uh, <laughs> he's weighted down with his his sovereigns. Um, so South Africa win, and South Africa win. This is their first Test victory, having. You know, suffered uh, having lost uh, lost all the Test matches that they played in the the period, all eight Test matches in the period before 1900, and uh, then having done a little better against Australia, but not not managed to win a Test. They finally have managed in 1905 to to win this to win this Test, uh, and and that becomes the moment when South African cricket changes, and that's used by Abe Bailey. To uh, along with Harris, and it's Harris and Bailey working together to set up the ICC, and the ICC becomes England, Australia, and now South Africa. South Africa has demonstrated that they are on a par with the other two, and that changes the face of cricket. That makes cricket that changes the face of international cricket, uh, and uh, and you know and and secures South Africa's position in at, at the at the top table of of international cricket right throughout until the Oliveira. Um, until, and of course, you do get uh, the other sides start coming in, New Zealand, West Indies, and so on. Uh, India, Pakistan, and, and uh, but the, the uh, South Africa is never put under any pressure to play against anybody other than uh, Australia, England, and of course, New Zealand. So South Africa only ever plays white sides and no one ever says a word about it. But it's partly because of the, the, the way the ICC was set up in the first place. I, I'm out of questions, but uh, is there anything you'd like me to ask you? Is there anything you don't feel we've touched upon that you'd like to touch upon? I, I no, I, I not, not specifically. I think we we pretty well covered uh, covered the the whole area. I mean, I think maybe if I could just say, I, I just want to make kind of two or three points really. One um, one about about the significance of the cricket. Uh, we talked a lot about the politics, and I quite agree with you that you one has to see the cricket in its context. And we talked about that context and how important it is. But the cricket itself is uh, is really compelling, and I think one of the important things about about this period, certainly from 1922. Um, I mean, the, the, just let me start by saying that the, post 1900, uh, the South Africa played seven. Um, now let me get let me get the, the numbers right sorry uh they, they played 15 tests um between 1900 and 1913 and there were there were seven each seven tests each south africa against uh, against england so they were all they were all pretty tight with a, 
uh, with a draw. South Africa won two of the series. Johnny Douglas brought Sydney Barnes, and and the rest is history for the third of those series in 1913-14, despite the fact that Herbie Taylor, and this was the biggest duel of the the entire 75 years, Barnes against Taylor. Yeah, you might later Bonds want to, want to share a few anecdotes so about about that rivalry. It's it's a truly cinematic one, isn't it? It is. It is exactly. It's exactly right. It needs to be. It needs to be on a screen. But uh, Bonds Bonds takes 49 wickets of 10.94 in four tests because he refuses to play in the last test because he hadn't been allowed to take a collection in any of the uh, despite the kinds of figures he had in the previous tests. Um, Taylor average is 50 in the context of that bonds is taking his so bonds takes these wickets taylor max taylor average is 50 in the series that's an utterly remarkable competition between the two there is a there is a lovely moment and i if, if you give me the time to mention it there is a lovely moment when uh, in the natal game not in the test match in the natal game which is the only game in which uh johnny douglas's guys get beaten uh, apart from apart from in the the test series, um, uh, Taylor is Taylor is batting with 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 Dave North, and uh, and and Taylor is playing him out, playing him out, and and it's it's a well known story. Dave, Taylor's Taylor Taylor's always there, farms the bowling, and it's always Taylor when Barnes comes on to bowl, and Barnes eventually throws down the ball. It's Taylor, Taylor, Taylor all the time, and storms off. For a rub down and whiskey and soda, so that's kind of that's the traditional story. But what happens after that is that, uh, of course, Dave North Dave North has an, one eye on the pavilion here, and about half an hour, forty minutes later, uh, he starts hitting, and uh, they've got they've got fifty or sixty to get to win the game, um, and and North is trying to do it in sixes. And so he hits a six, he puts the next one up, just gets dropped uh, or, or gets very close to a field. He doesn't get a hold of it. And, uh, and Taylor comes down the wicket. He says, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? Um, and he said, and, and North says, it's Barnes. I can't play him. And, and Taylor says, well, he's, well, Barnes is off. He's gone. He's not here. He says, he says, look up at the balcony. I can see the bastard. He's coming back. <laughs> So, <laughs> which kind of summed up the way people thought about Sydney Barnes, and even somebody uh, with Dave North's legendary nerve and and ability. Uh, so anyway, they won the the tell, of course, won the game, and 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 uh, while North was out pretty soon afterwards, um, Taylor Taylor saw it through. So so that was uh, that, that was one thing. The other thing I wanted to mention. Um, was that from 1922 and to 1964-65, in other words, for the, the eight series, the major sweep of this, uh, the cricket is, is totally, uh, well, I use the word compelling, but I, I think there are, there, there are better words perhaps for this, but incredibly competitive. Um, the, the, in, all of those, in all of those series, they were not decided until the end of the last test. The last day of the last test was where the final, uh, you know, who won and who lost the series. I think, uh, I think oh, a point was... you've made to me is that it was far more interesting and far more competitive than the Ashes uh, during the same that. period. Yeah, That is exactly the point that I would make here, is that we have all this kind of general hoo-ha, traditionalist cricket history writing around the significance of the Ashes. But if you want to look at real cricket, not only... In terms of the duels between between players, and I mentioned obviously I just mentioned Norse and Barnes. There are lots of others. There's some really good ones involving Tayfield and and Insol, for example. Um, the, the 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 cricket is compelling. The uh, the and, and the results are always in the you know are always unclear until the end. I mean the Ashes, of course, the ten series during the same period. Um, I think seven of those rubbers were uh, were dead before the end of the last test match. So the last test match was just a waste of time. This, these were in Australia. Of course, they were a bit closer in the UK and in England, but uh, in Australia it was uh, it was pretty one-sided stuff. So why people bother with the Ashes, I don't know. 
Um, well, I do know, but you know, in cricketing terms, we need to look at the, these series as if we want to see really, you know, really fundamentally exciting cricket, and that's what brought the crowds in. And they, they, uh, it's, it's, it was a, a long period of time where cricket was was really fundamental. Um, uh, the, I guess, the third point I wanted to make was about Peter May. Uh, now, Peter May was one of these guys. You, you, there are lots of hagiographies around Peter May and so on, uh, and and we know that his views were were uh, pretty much on the right, um, and he was one of the members of the selection committee uh, that didn't select Oliveira under under Doug Insel. Anyway, Peter May was uh, Peter May was captain, and Doug Insel was vice captain in the nineteen fifty six seven series. And uh, Peter May made four hundreds before we got anywhere near the first test. He made four consecutive hundreds, um, and the last was a, a double hundred against uh, against Radisha, played in Salisbury, uh, Radisha in those days. And uh, at the end of that game, he made two hundred and nineteen, I think. And at the end of that game, everybody was thinking, "How do we deal with Peter May? What can what's possible? But how can we manage Peter May?" And so he, um, so the the mayor of the mayor of Salisbury, a guy called Harry Pachanek, uh, came up on stage during the presentation ceremony at the end of this dinner and presentation, or whatever, carrying this duck, this live quacking duck, and and handed over this sort of flapping quacking creature to Peter May and said, "Well, you know, if anything's going to change your luck, this has got to be it." So he gave it to Peter May, and lots of hilarity all around, of course. So Peter May goes and plays the next game, and they play against Tr a strong Transvaal side. Uh, Peter Heine is playing for Transvaal. Peter Heine gets in first ball. That, that's it. And, uh, and, and Nick's one behind. And then in, in, in the series itself, he scores 100 and, 156 runs at 15. It's his worst series ever anywhere. And it's really interesting to say, to think, well, you know, was there was there some sort of psychological thing behind this? Is this did the duck do Peter May? And the chances are that on some level it did, but I'm not perhaps in the way people think. I think what happened was that the the duck made Peter May think that this is all a matter of bad luck. Peter May doesn't change his technique during the series. He gets out to some brilliant catches, and but it always looks like it's bad luck, and the duck thing is part kind of part of that. But actually, in reality, he's found out. And the way the bowlers bowl at him and the way the, the way the whole thing operates, the field settings and so on, for Peter May, I mean, I, I wasn't there, but I, I, I get a pretty pretty clear feeling that actually Peter May has been sussed out here, but he hasn't been able mentally to examine this himself and to think, mm, hang on a minute, maybe I should be doing things a bit different. He's still thinking this is, a, this is just bad luck, that bloody duck, you know, that's what... That's what he's thinking. And of course, Peter May is also having a bit of a nightmare on the captaincy front because he uh, he, he won't let Johnny Wardle bowl his uh, bowl his, his left arm wrist spin. Uh, he wants him to bowl left arm orthodox. And Johnny Wardle is the difference between the two sides. And he wins the uh, he wins one test outright uh, and could easily have won one of the others. But the series ends up drawn to all after Tayfield essentially massacres the uh, the England the England side in the uh, in the fourth test at the Wanderers which is the and, and which is the best but takes nine for 113 the best bowling performance in the 20th century according to wisdom um, remarkable bowling performance um, but that's kind of so that's the other side of Peter May and it's it's an interesting it's a, you know there, there are incidents like this on all the tours but that one that one's interesting because of peter who peter may was in the context of south africa and i think we've got about two hours worth of material here so yeah i, I think that's more than enough to be getting on with thanks so much for your time oh, uh, that's, a, that's a pleasure how's the book doing oh. by the way oh well i don't know actually but oh. I, I did i did a um I, I did a talk to the Cricket Society uh, a couple of weeks ago okay. on, on, on this, uh, which, if you're interested, I can send you a link to. Oh, We've covered please, a bit of the same ground. Please but, do. Uh, yeah. There've been other things covered too, uh, but if you're if you're interested in, I'd hearing, be very interested indeed. Yeah, I, I, I did think of sending it to you, but I didn't want to prejudice what you wanted to, you know, to talk about. So no, I, fair enough. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I can do it now. Um, yeah, and, but at that, and then there was a lot of there was a lot of interest actually. I, you know, there were there were 
sort of 40 or 50 people there and and uh, and i sold you know i sold a few copies which means that I'm, my sales are definitely in double figures that's what i was trying okay. to get <laughs> now in double figures right. sure. but right. i don't know i don't know exactly more than that um it's been uh, and in terms of in terms of listings and things it's been long listed for the book of the year but that doesn't get decided until march i think or february march something like that so well hopefully you give the lie to mr engel's uh, rather pessimistic pronouncement about uh, the state of cricket literature you're right well i hope uh, i've been, I've been right reading I hope things have improved since actually. i've been reading some direct just lately hey books books yeah. with really promising titles by authors i generally respect and and you can yeah. tell it was all the publisher's idea and and our, our, our poor writer has been slaving against a, a deadline frantically pulling references from wikipedia not double checking them just really depressing yeah. stuff whereas yeah. whereas you know this is serious history i find the problem you get with cricket literature is the original yeah. stuff tends to be really badly written self-published yeah. crap and uh, yeah. the well-written stuff tends to be really badly researched you know <laughs> yeah yeah no no right well I, I hope i haven't done too badly on on both of those i mean no you've done you know, brilliantly on both i I'd, yeah. I'd say that the the serious um almost a academic minded stuff coming out of south africa at the moment is yeah. is the best cricket literature has to offer right now you know right. those circles right. in oh, which well. you're you're tracking yeah great yeah no, well that's that's fantastic. i mean you you, you must think so yeah. too it's it's definitely the most fecund and and energetic of yeah. um of of cricket's various bailiwicks as it were yeah i i think i think i hope it is um and uh, and i i yeah i think that's probably true i i think what's i think i think what's happening of course is that it is about this whole you know this whole notion of of transformation and giving cricket you know giving cricket history back you know the the idea that that it's it's south africans need to know where they come from and they need to know what they need to know what their history really is and uh, and it's stuff like this which allows you to do it i mean i mean what drove me with regard to this book well you know i've had two sort of areas of of interest my whole life you know one has been south african history you know the politics the, the whole roads and segregation and my master's degree in 1981 i think was was on roads and the origins of segregation so nothing to do with cricket i never i didn't know about the cricket connection then um so i wrote it on why why and how this happened um and then my you know i've been interested in the the cricket side of this stuff uh since well really since i discovered crom hendrix and that i mean although i'd always been interested before that till i discovered this there was this guy called crom hendrix and, and took it from there uh, so this this book kind of brings those two things together and it does as I say because i think you can't understand one without the other and the two and it's you know frankly uh, it's a, it's a really good way of educating people about the history of south africa um you know to 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 put it together in a, in the context of a of 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 sport and cricket history um to to int to engage people outside south africa you know particularly engage uh, again you know people in south africa may know some of this but but people in the uk and and elsewhere don't and i think there's a lot of stuff in here about as i say the relationships between you know mines labor uh political resistance the whole question of nazism which we haven't touched on uh, but which i think is a fascinating area the story of roby Librant, i think is a is a remarkable story in terms of sport in south africa we haven't and touched much on labor either you you have no. a, you have a wonderfully again quite cinematic episode um just just down the road from from the wanderers where the air force is is dropping bomb bombs on uh, striking workers absolutely we're, we're, while while kez king edward's school and and uh, uh, and JP, you're playing cricket. Yeah, quite. Uh, overseen by a tourist who was one of the England tourists from uh, from 1889. Uh, that's right. That's right. Playing cricket in with the bombs going off, the the bombs being Smuts's Smuts's own planes flying over and 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 bombing bombing white labour. The same white labour who are you know who are arguing this. You know workers of the world unite and fight for a white south africa you would have thought an episode like that might have focused the minds a bit you know perhaps we have 
more in common interest-wise with our black brethren than uh, we've hitherto suspected. You would you would think so, but of course the the, the problem that why there, there is a you know I, I mean you know I'm not a sort of Marxist structuralist specifically you know and structuralism under we got a really bad press but there is a there is a fundamental opposition between however you describe it between white labor and black labor i mean in the end the mine owners would like to have a, a, a you know a greater percentage of black labor because they could get away with paying them less obviously and reducing the number of white labor who frankly didn't add much to the whole equation you know they they could have they could have paid they could have, uh, they, the, 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 you know, they were paying a tenth of the wages to black labor than they did to whites. They could quite easily have changed the equation. So, you know, the, the white labor force was, was 5% or whatever in managerial capacities or whatever. And the whole white mine were, minor thing disappear entirely. And that was what, what white miners were so paranoid about because they didn't, they didn't have anything they could really go with. You know, they didn't really have a great deal to offer. You know, because the, the skills they had could be picked up, you know, like when were being picked up immediately by black workers who had a pretty, you know, underground and you knew exactly what they needed to do and how all this stuff worked. And, you know, the, the job color bar was always based on this thing, this thing called a blasting certificate. If you were white, you could have a blasting certificate. In other words, you could handle dynamite. You say so you'd set the charges and you'd, you'd light it and down would come the stuff and they would dig it all out and, and then you'd set the next charges. That's how the whole thing worked. Drill the holes in the rock to put the char dynamite in and so on. But you couldn't have a blasting certificate if you were black. So that was what that's what created the divide, was that only whites could could throw dynamite around. So <laughs> so you know that that's that's pretty fundamental to this. But the mine the mine owners could change that really easily. And and there were moments when they almost did and and the early 1920s was one which is why you got a civil a civil war i mean it was a civil war and and not only that i mean in fact the the uh, the workers took over johannesburg for a week uh you know set up that, their that, own that's something i want to read about south africa's very own commune sounds very exciting yeah. <laughs> let me let me th let, uh, let me think about that and i'll, I'll send you i'll send you uh, the sort of stuff that gets my pulse racing i've got to say yeah yeah. I must uh I must go rustle up some dinner quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. Good, good, great to talk to you. Cheers, Rodney. Oh well, bye bye.